Okay, and welcome back to those of you who have been uh, been with us here since 2 o'clock and to those of you who have just signed on. I want to welcome you to uh, the latest in uh, the Design World webinar series. My name is Miles Budimer, and uh, you're here for the webinar today entitled Motors and the Current State of Motion Technology. So I want to welcome everyone here. Um, so it looks like we'll, uh, we will get things going here. Uh, prior to starting the webinar, a few uh, housekeeping items to go over. Um, everybody who has registered for this webinar will get a copy of the webinar afterwards through email, and it, is also, uh, it will also be up at designworldonline.com after the webinar is over. Also keep in mind that uh, at the end of the webinar, we will have um, some time left over for a Q&A session. So uh, if at any time during the webinar you think of a question you would like to ask, uh, you can just go ahead there uh, and uh, go to the questions tab and enter your question and we will do our best to get to as many questions as we can. And lastly, uh, you can um, tweet about this webinar in real time if you're on Twitter and the hashtag for the webinar is right there on the screen, which is hashtag DWWebinar. So, uh, as I've already said, uh, I will be the moderator for today's webinar, and uh, my name is Miles Budimir, and I'm the uh, Senior Editor for Motion Control with uh, Design World Magazine. I've been covering the motion control area for quite a few years now. Uh, and uh, our presenter today for the webinar will be Dan Jones of uh, Incromotion, uh, associates. I've had the pleasure of knowing and working with Dan for many, many years, um, and uh, I'll give you uh, a, a little bit of his bio here. Um, Dan Jones uh, received his BSEE degree from Hofstra University uh, way back in 1965 and a MS in mathematics in 1969. He has over 50 years of experience in the, uh, the design of all types of uh, electric motors and generators anywhere from you know, 10 watt units up to 500 kilowatts, uh, and he's held various engineering design and management and marketing management uh, positions at a, uh, at a number of different companies. He's recognized as an international uh, authority on electric motors and motion control. He's written over 250 technical articles and papers and has held seminars in 10 countries. Uh, he's a past member of the board of directors of SMMA, and uh, EMERF, and he's currently a member of the Board of Directors of the Motion Control um, Association, and he is a life member of IEEE and a member of ASME uh, as well. So Dan comes with to us here with uh, uh, a long and very uh, impressive list of, of, um, of uh, achievements and uh, knowledge as well. So I'm uh, really looking forward to uh, uh, Dan's presentation here today. So uh, with that, uh, I think I will probably uh, just turn it over to Dan and uh, get, uh, get things rolling here. So Dan, uh, it's all yours. Thank you. Uh, welcome all. I have spent a number of, uh, I have to say decades, tracking uh, new motor developments through a number of activities which include shows, conferences, magazine articles, patents, and other sources. I have selected four motor developments that have begun production activities or are ready to begin production activities. Let's begin the presentation. First slide. What is driving our market? Well, we have a lot of things, you know, on the side of uh, new uh, supporting products. You know, we have new motors, we have new power devices, we have new software tools, we have new controller ICs, we have new feedback devices. All of these are helping improve motion control. And I use the term motion control to cover all the elements within a motion control system. Although today I will be focusing on the motor itself. Well, one of the interesting things about motor technologies is many of our academics talk about them for about 20 years before they begin to move into production. 
Some motor technologies await the needs of new applications and, of course, new drive and control developments. The emergence of new needs, new applications, drives the development of new motor technologies. Well, what are some of the new needs that the market is asking motor design engineers to work on? Certainly energy savings. We talk about motor efficiencies being improved. You know, electric technology replacing pneumatic or hydraulic. Weight savings in a number of applications. Um, certainly for the uh, position side, more torque. And I call it the torque weight density. And from the side uh, of speed, more power density. All these things, any combination of them, drive uh, the need for new types of motors. Applications, aircraft pumps, actuators, hybrid and electric vehicles, handheld portable electric tools. Just in the last year with electric tools, the portables with the lithium ion batteries have gone from universal motors to brushless permanent magnet motors. Certainly battlefield and on the other end, household robots. There are many electric motors of various sizes, types, and shapes within those products. Medical diagnostic machines, the MRIs, the PET scans, the CAT scans, uh, you know, the powered prosthetics. One of the uh, companies I talk about is working on an ankle and a knee powered prosthetic. And I'll get into that, uh, you know, later as we get into that part of the presentation. We have a problem. Hold on for a second. I want, there we go. All right, when I look at motors, I must divide them into three major areas. Constant speed, variable speed, variable position. These are classes of controlled motion, and the motors fit in in different ways within each of these uh, uh, systems. Certainly constant speed was some of the earlier uh, items, and we still use them in a number of appliances we would find within our, um, our home. A variable speed, well, that's become extremely important in order to improve efficiencies of uh, a number of motor types to give us a wide range of control. And then the variable position, which usually goes by the name position servo. Uh, you know, we need uh, uh, more torque, smaller package, number of other things that are required, uh, you know, to uh, fulfill the needs of these various positions. This is a, a slide from uh, um, the speed program that I use for designing motors. Um, it, pretty much has uh, simulation programs for each one. And on this list, we will be looking at uh, uh, the brushless PM. And you'll notice there are two of them. Depending on how we control it, the one uh, that shows in the middle of the screen, brushless PM AC, is shown as a buried magnet approach. And uh, it will generally be driven by uh, AC current sine wave signals. The brushless PM at the bottom left will be a little bit more square wave driven as opposed to the sine wave approach. We will also talk about synchronous reluctance and switched reluctance within the four types that I have chosen to utilize for part of this uh, talk. Well, we have three basic constructions or configurations of motors. Most of them are radial air gap type. You can look at them as being a barrel, and the air gap goes along the axial length of the barrel. And of course, 
PM brushless, switched and synchronous reluctance induction motors are good examples of those. They are by far the most popular configuration today. But new ones coming along are the axial air gap or axial flux motors. And I will have a couple of examples of those. And most recently, the transverse flux motor. And that will be the last uh, uh, application or, you know, that I will look at in the presentation. Well, here's an, an example out of my speed program showing the traditional, you know, radial air gap motor. You can see the blue for the uh, laminations. You can see the two types of uh, magnets, the north, you know, uh, colored black and the south colored white. And the, the gap is radial along the axial length of the motor. This is by far our most popular motor. This one is a surface magnet type. There are a number of them. I won't be able to cover them all, but I can point out the ones that uh, I will be using here. Well, to look at what is an axial air gap or axial flux motor, this is a typical example. You can see magnets on either end of the uh, of the the, uh, the the cylinders, you know, le left and right, and the wire is in the center. And this is a slotless version because there is no iron to capture the flux and aim it. Well, here is our synchronous reluctance motor, a lot more complicated, but it has some major advantages, which I will get into later on in the presentation. But the, the rotor is where the action is. Quite frankly, the stator, which you see on the outside, if it's a three-phase device, has the same uh, winding as an induction motor or a three-phase permanent magnet brushless. But the rotor is where the differences are with these various motor technologies. And of course, one that's been around a very long time, it comes and it goes on the average of once a decade, the 80s, 90s, 2000s, and again now. And uh, we will not talk much about this particular motor, but as you can see it, it is a very simple motor. It is the simplest of all. We have coils wrapped around the teeth. We have the rotor that's laminated. They are also soft wire, soft iron teeth in terms of where they're at. And this is the, as I believe, the simplest construction of all. Uh, it does have a difficulty in that the drives that we can use on almost all the three-phase motors cannot be used on a, on a switched reluctance. It needs its own special drive. Well, the first one we will talk about will be the axial flux motor version one, which is Yasa. It's a British company and outgrowth from Oxford University. Uh, just uh, two months ago, it was the winner of the Drace, Drayson Racing FIA World Land Speed Record at 204 miles per hour. Now, this is focused on electric driven vehicles. We've already seen the construction of it, so we can go by it. And if we wanted to look at the speed versus the power, one of the things that you will learn about any permanent magnet motor is that as you raise the voltage, you will raise the power of the motor. And you see in this particular uh, torque uh, power curve or speed power curve that the uh, uh, current is fixed, the temperature is essentially fixed, and we're looking at the increase in speeds and power as we go up with increases in voltage. This one is not quite as easy to, uh, to look at, but you're looking at a 350 millimeter by 88 millimeter uh, OD and axial uh, length. And you've got a nice plot here that shows you that the efficiency of any motor changes with where the load is within the area 
of the use of the motor itself based on its torque and its speed. Uh, it shows you that close to the no load, uh, the zero speed end of it, uh, you will, uh, based on their controller, you will have a very low uh, performance as you would expect. As you raise the speed, it moves further and further into its higher power efficiency area so you get to the center of it where it is over 95% in power efficiency. Well, applications where we can find in-hub motors, electric bikes, electric scooters, PM generators. But now we're talking about generators that can go up to one and two um, mega watts in terms of its output. One of the problems that some of the generators have today is the gearbox that many of them use with the older technology has a very poor record of, uh, of uh, life. So eliminating it is one of the major trends in that market. Rotary tables, robots, particularly in the waist and the elbow, will use the axial flux motors. And the uh, automobile starter generator combinations in some of our latest automobiles. Now these, this is just a summary list. There are a lot more applications that um, the technology is used in. Well, with any motor that you will find, there is no one motor that will solve all problems. Each motor type has its own advantage and disadvantage. And from my perspective, I've tried to list them as I see them. Their advantage is certainly high power density, high power efficiency. And if it's used in a vehicle, it generally is fluid cool to extend its performance. Disadvantages, very high rotor inertia, which in that application is not a problem. Complex uh, lamination structure. You're looking at a lamination structure that is essentially a circle. It spirals out. So it's much more difficult to manufacture. And of course, it is using very high energy magnets. And uh, right now, rare earth magnets, particularly neodymium iron boron, you know, uh, have gone through a very difficult rise in price and now a very slow drop in, in price over the last two or three years. Well, here is a separate technology. This one has just, I think, been finished from a, an R&D company in Japan called the iMotor. And the technology is looking at using an, an axial flux motor in a very different way from the Yasta motor that we just uh, talked about. It is looking at uh, uh, changing the magnetic field to achieve the widest speed range that it can, achieve, it can be achieved. So instead of looking at power, they're looking at uh, the speed side. Well, as you can see, it is a rather complex structure. We're looking at two stators. The wire has been moved for ease of uh, looking at it. We're looking at the permanent magnet, uh, you know, rotor. Uh, you see the colors for the different uh, poles. Uh, we have a green element, which is a field magnet. It can be either rare earth or ferrite. And then we have an exciter coil that surrounds the, uh, the rest of the structure that we see to the right. You see the exciter coil by itself uh, at the bottom of the picture and the combination of all three of them on the left picture. Now, you know, what we're looking at is uh, a, you know, I, I put this slide in because it describes, uh, you know, something of its operation and each part of the structure. I've gone over most of the structure, uh, but it, I, the idea is changing the magnetic flux flow in the motor in order to field weaken, which means 
lower the back EMF and achieve a much wider speed range. The other things they've done is they've tried to balance the waveform so that they maintain at least a, a, a reasonable amount of torque. Now this is their what they call their HB1 slash SHB1. They now are on their version 5, which I am beginning to work on for them. And uh, it will be a much simpler structure to achieve um, the idea of very wide speed range adjustment. And with this particular one, uh, the use of the ferrite magnets, um, the uh, Field weakening approach that they're using means they have lots of, uh, of speed, but not enough torque. So they had to use a, a gearbox in order to gain the torque back. But the combination of the gearbox with the motor is about three quarters of the cost of a uh, you know conventional uh, axial flux permanent magnet motor. So this was an attempt by this company to reduce cost. Now this is the beginning of the process. They've moved on to other ways of doing this, but they're not ready for me to uh, to display it yet in presentations. That will occur sometime next year. Well, this is their range of applications. Uh, they're looking where speed is a very important variable and torque is relatively constant. The advantages using ferrite magnets, very wide speed range, lower cost, lower inertia with the gearbox decouple. Disadvantages, they have to use a gearbox. The pancake shape limits their drop-in replacements. Well, we're going to move on to something that was announced at the SPS IPC shows last year from Asaya Brown Bavaria. Uh, they are looking at moving from IE2 to IE4. What that particular condition is, is increasing the efficiency of the motor. There is one area where the U.S. has been ahead in energy efficiency, and it's been with larger three-phase induction motors. We have a version of them we call the premium motor. Well, Europe is behind us in this area, and their catch-up approach will be the IE4. And last year, ABB developed an entire product line of higher efficiency motors as, as drop-in replacements for the induction using a very different motor technology called synchronous reluctance. Well, this is a slide that talks about, you know, the uh, synchronous reluctance. It is a four pole. You'll notice the blue and the white for the rotor. Uh, you can look at the, uh, the, uh, the white being the flux patterns and the blue being the insulation support for the, uh, for the motor in terms of uh, focusing the flux and directing it where it needs to go. This is a synchronous motor, so it will have better performance overall than any equivalent sized induction motor. And of course, ABB has gone beyond just the difference between asynchronous and synchronous motors. Well, from there, some of their slides, the traditional induction motor is on the left. They have come up with two families of synchronous reluctance motors to replace the induction motors. We're going to be looking at the IE4 synchronous reluctance motor. There is another uh, you know, family that we will not be looking at, but both of them are reducing losses in the motor. And the focus is almost always on the rotor to begin with. And from one of their slides, they talk about the black being the original uh, IE2 motor. Uh, and the light blue being the performance of the new synchronous reluctance motor. This is at 50 horsepower or 37 
kilowatts for those of you that are metrified. And you can look at the losses. The losses uh, are reduced by 1.1 kilowatts, which if you take them and look at loss alone, that's a 61% drop in loss. <coughs> when you look at the efficiency impact, we're at 92.7 on the IE2, and we go to 95.3. Well, that's only what a little, a little less than uh, two and a half, 2.6 percent efficiency. <coughs> so we have to work very hard to get these losses out of the motor in order to just get incremental improvements of efficiency. Now, from the European side of things, you're uh, you know they're they're pegging it against the, you know, the amount of money that can be saved and the amount of CO2 that will not be created based on uh, utilizing these motors. The benefit, of course, in terms of the calculation is in the blue box on the upper uh, left side of the, of the uh, screen. Well, this is an entire product line that they have developed. It goes uh, from the IEC frame 160 to IEC frame 315. We look at it, of course, Europe always talks about kilowatts. We talk about horsepower still in this area. We're looking at 1,500 to about 200, uh, 15 horsepower to about 240 horsepower. And now we're meeting the new high efficiency levels. <coughs> They're direct replacement for induction motors. Since uh, they reduce the losses, the bearings run cooler, the windings run cooler. There are no permanent magnets. <coughs> Excuse me. And there are many um, projects going, both government and non-government, looking at trying to come up with ways of eliminating the rare earth magnet motors as we speak today. This is just one example of that. It is optimized for variable speed drive operation. They spent a, a little over two and a half years, you know, getting the uh, software control where they wanted it. And of course, ABB is number two in Europe in terms of motion control. They are a true global company. Advantages and disadvantages. Number one, no magnets. Number two, uses the conventional inverter drive. <coughs> the higher torque density than the induction motors higher power factor. Power factor is that loss that one has that the power utilities have to put up with. It's not useful energy and it pulls down our, our power grid and it has a much higher one than the induction, somewhere around 0.8 to 0.9. They have a very wide constant power and speed range and they are brushless. Disadvantages, it is a complicated rotor construction. It is nonlinear torque versus current, which is part of the reason for their special software control that they have, so that uh, you know they control things across the wide range of operation. Well, we're now moving. We're moving into the transverse flux motor. And I pulled this history one because it is the most, I guess, the latest version of the type of brushless PM motor that has come out. Uh, for a long while, only academia with very large computers could simulate the magnetic action of this particular uh, motor. It required very large computers during the 1980s and into the 1990s. Even our simulation programs at that time were quite rudimentary. And that started to change in the mid 1990s with a, a number of programs that we use in the design. I happen to use Speed, but there's Ansoft, Infolitica, uh, a number of other programs out there that also do an excellent job. This is a three phase brushless PM motor type. Well,
Well, we look at the early transverse flux structure. You can see the magnets, the north-south, north-south, north-south. This comes from Dr. Way's paper. You can see the, she, see the shape of the soft iron in the form of a C to complete the magnetic circuit. And that other device that looks like a piece of uh, square, uh, you know, uh, shape is the is the copper wire that is the winding in the motor. So it can be just a very simple ring winding, surrounded by many many poles. As you can see when we look at the right side of the presentation. You know, we have the three-phase motor. It has 100 poles on it, uh, six lamb stacks and return steel. It's manufactured, you know, with, you know, by uh, using, uh, you know, silicon iron for lambs. Um, the magnets, of course, are generally, uh, you know, a neodymium iron boron. And uh, the uh, company that makes this, this is a company called uh, Electric Torque Machines. Uh, you know, has the comment that it is commonly available, you know, using common materials and, uh, you know, common manufacturing uh, methods. I did borrow a number of the slides from them because they began presenting this motor last year. It is a relatively new product. It has just been released within the last year. So to the left is my favorite Speed 2D program. But with this motor, you must use 3D finite element analysis software because it is a three-dimensional magnetic circuit, much more complicated magnetically than the other motors. Well, this slide's not as easy to see as I would, uh, I would like, but on the one side, you have the radial flux showing you the magnetic flux in blue. On the right side, you have the, uh, uh, you know, the transverse flux motor, and you'll see the, the circle and the way it works. The uh, radial flux moves from one tooth across to the other tooth in the same plane. The transverse flux flux, mo you know, moves in a C or a circular configuration. So you can see the three-dimensional versus the two-dimensional configuration. Well, we're going to look at the coil. Now, when I first looked at that TFM stator to the left, I said, that looks more like a rotor. But buried inside there is a number of TFM coils. And of course, the conventional motor is shown to the right. In this case, it is a segmented uh, stator approach because you'll notice the coils on that motor are around each tooth independently. And, uh, you know, the type of resistance, you'll get a lot lower resistance, you know, 17 milliohms versus 100 between the transverse flux and the radial flux motor. Core losses are about one third at the same um, torque level. Copper used is about half. And the continuous torque is three and a half times. Now we'll have a direct comparison looking at things that are uh, essentially the same side. I put this one in because it gives us a good idea of what you really have to look at if you want to improve the efficiency of a motor. I mean, it's a, it's a very good uh, representation with the watts in on the left and the watts out on the right. You know voltage and current versus torque and speed. And number of poles that you have, the frequency that you generate has a big impact on the uh, eddy current losses. The higher the frequency, the higher the eddy current losses will be. So you'll see the one on the top and you'll see to the left side, the frequency, uh, a combination of frequency losses and a number of other conditions, a thickness of lamb, uh, material used, uh, showing you the eddy current losses, and they are second order. They go up by the uh, by the square in terms of the frequency. 
So the losses go up very quickly as you go to higher speeds. And of course, the losses that all motors will share along with the uh, eddy currents will be the, uh, the I squared R losses from the copper coil resistance. So this gives you a pretty good idea. And of course, we have the friction losses too. Well, here's that comparison slide, looking at a half a horsepower for roughly uh, 370 uh, uh, watts of output. So on the left, we have a conventional brushless motor with a uh, planetary uh, gearhead. And it's uh, everything is normalized to 15.1 foot-pounds. And as I remember, that's about 13 newton meters. Um, looking at the RPM, we're looking at uh, 175 and 200. And here are the weights. Um, the weight of the um, conventional motor, let's call conventional brushless motor with a gearbox is 50 pounds. The weight of the direct drive rotary motor, which is one that is a radial flux motor, but is uh, has a pancake shape. It is... Uh, uh, you know, has uh, 59 pounds, and you can certainly see the uh, transverse flux motor uh, is uh, much, much lower in weight and in volume. Um, so you can see that um, you can get more out of this motor in terms of its physical size or weight. Well, advantages. Highest torque weight density of any motor, pound for pound, I can find. Highest continuous torque per volume. Lowest intern low internal losses. There are still some. Simplest winding, it's just a coil. Disadvantages. Limited speed. It's generally used under 1,000 RPM. So in most cases, it's a direct drive motor, as is the direct drive rotary motor that was the middle comparison on the previous slide. It also has a very complicated construction. <clears throat> well, I've come to the end of the talk. This I'd have to call this a snapshot look at some of the new uh, products that are being out, developed out there. There are quite a few others. You know, so there are many more new motor developments, developments, new applications, and new needs. Higher power density motors certainly are appearing. Uh, we will begin to see higher torque density motors in a number of configurations as well with the transverse flux motor leading that charge. New motors for even higher power densities are uh, are coming forth, and we'll have a lot more new motor developments to come. This is the uh, end of the presentation. Uh, I'm about uh, three minutes early, so I will turn it, I think, back to Miles for any questions that you have. Okay. Well, good. Thanks, Dan. Um, and there's, uh, well, uh, now we can open it up for any uh, questions. Uh, we can have a um, uh, a uh, Q and A session here. So if you've uh, if you have any questions for Dan about anything uh, either in the uh, in the presentation or maybe something that Dan didn't cover that's um, related to motors or motion technology, please feel free to uh, put your question in there. And like I said, we will try um, we will try to get to uh, as many of these questions as we can given our given our time here. So. Um, so let me start off with uh, with one question here. This is uh, let's see, this is a uh, it's a question from uh, <clears throat> from Jeffrey. Um, so he uh, he is, his question basically uh, says that many applications such as robotics uh, require either zero or low backlash at high torque. Uh, so his question is then: Are there any motors that might suit that need? Uh, that is uh, that they not require a a gear reduction, which can introduce some backlash into the into the system. So maybe, uh, you know, maybe which uh, maybe which of these types, or maybe which of other types, would be 
the best suited for something like that kind of application? Well, there are a couple of uh, motors that can do that. The key is to reduce cogging and uh, also to minimize uh, torque ripple within the motor. The DDR motors are certainly uh, good at that, uh, and there's a version of them that are slotless, where they have eliminated the uh, soft iron teeth, and it, you, know, you sacrifice a little torque to get almost no uh, interruption of motion around your zero position point. So there's essentially no cogging, and the torque ripple is very low. So DDR motors are that way. Your conventional radial flux, there are a number of them that have been designed to have as low a cogging torque, uh, you know, and a, and a, um, a, a problem with the, um, um, oh gosh, I it. well, let's look at the cogging torque, as low a cogging torque and torque ripple. That was the one I was trying to think of. Okay. Um, so that we do not have the problem. So you've got a couple of solutions you can use. It's a trade-off in how much torque do you want to give up versus how smooth do you have to be in motion and in positioning. Okay. Okay. Um, that's good. So let's uh, let's see a uh, few other few other questions here. Um, there's a question about, uh, I guess it's just a general question about uh, brushless gimbal motors. Have you have you heard of those motors? I've heard of them, but I've not had any opportunity. That's the three-dimensional motor, I believe. Okay. It works in three axes. But I've not had much opportunity to work with anything such as that. Okay. But they do um, fill the need in a certain number of applications. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, can we... Uh, uh, could, uh, could you explain uh, some more about the concept of cogging? That was All right. uh, we, yeah. we have a difference of opinion between AC motor guys and uh, brushless or, and DC motor guys. Mm -hmm. so I utilize that. For the induction motor, cogging is a function of energized moving at very low speed. Okay. When you get to the permanent magnet motors of all kinds, cogging is a function of unenergized magnetic attraction. Both of them cause problems in uh, low speed operation. Mm -hmm. So you have to solve the problem by a number of ways. Okay. All right. Um, so here's a question about a, uh, a different kind of motor here. This is uh, from uh, uh, from Barry, and the question is, what type of motor is the concept, is the Kepi motor, K-E-P-P-E, -P -P -E, and how does it fit into your motor classification? Have you heard of that motor? Or? I've heard of it, but I don't know much about it uh, at this point. Um, I, it's been mentioned a couple of times, uh -huh. but I, I'm afraid I can't help you now. Maybe in my uh, presentation I will do at uh, Motor Drive and Systems where I cover the uh, new technology again, I'll, I'll be able to put that motor in. Okay. Is that is that a DC motor or an AC motor? Or? As far as I know, it's a, it's a speed-based motor. Uh-huh. Okay. So we would probably look at it as AC, but we have an interesting problem. You know, uh, what does what does the motor get as opposed to what is the power you put into the uh, you know to the electronics? Mm-hmm. Okay, good point. Okay. Um, so here's a, uh, here's a question about uh, uh, from uh, Viage, and his, uh, the question here is which of these, uh, these motors that, that we talked about here is also good as a low RPM generator? I'm assuming of the three types that you, that you talked about there. Well, the... Uh... The axial flux and the transverse flux are probably going to be much better motors for any generator design. I've had the privilege of using the, both of those designs in, uh, in 500 kilowatt generators. Okay. All right. Um, here's a question about the transverse flux motor. Um, <clears throat> and the question is, could they be battery powered? Uh, 
uh, you mentioned complex construction, it says, but uh, but if manufacturing high volume, would they be cost effective or as cost effective, I guess, as brushless DC and a, and a gearbox for the transverse flux? The answer to that is, is, uh, is something that you probably should direct at electric torque machines. But my feeling is that um, uh, they will end up being maybe 20% more expensive than the uh, radial air gap motors once they go through a lot of, uh, of uh, production uh, uh, design, development, and tooling in order to bring the cost down. Now they're in low quantity and they're you know much higher in cost. But traditionally, every motor goes down as the quantity goes up and the tooling and the automation gets better. Uh -huh. And then what about uh, the uh, battery part, uh, the battery oh, power battery. part of it? It, yeah. it, it would work, uh, you know, certainly on batteries. One of the applications that they did share with me is working on, um, you know, on the, uh, you know, replacements uh, for, an auto, for an ankle or for a, uh, you know, or for a, an automatic leg. The motors uh -huh. are very small. They produce a lot of torque. And I believe all those are battery operated. Okay. <clears throat> That's an interesting application for those. Yeah, prosthetics, I guess. I never can say yeah. that word right, yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, all right, so here's another uh, here's another question from uh, Jay Dov. Uh, let's see. Uh, question is, what percentage efficiency of a synchronous reluctance motor uh, can achieve in comparison with permanent magnet rotor of the same volume? That is an excellent question. I still think, in, you know, in my opinion, that the ultimate efficiency will still come from a permanent magnet motor. The problem that we have right now with permanent magnet motors is the cost of the magnets. Right. You know, so that seems to be a bigger problem. It's can we build a very high efficiency motor with ferrite magnets? Uh, there is one on the market now using ferrite magnets. It's at 92% for a five horsepower uh, motor. That is a company called Novatorque. So uh -huh. there is lots of work being done on trying to uh, <clears throat> eliminate rare earth and go to ferrite. But there are also some things being done to make uh, uh, you know, rare earth more cost effective. You've yeah. got a lot of things happening that will happen in the future. Okay. Yeah, so I guess maybe on that uh, uh, on that note, uh, I was going to ask too about uh, the role of magnets really in 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 this whole motor motor story, and you kind of touched on it there somewhat. But uh, so uh, so what you're seeing is uh, is some more use of the uh, ferrite. Uh, Type of magnets then? Either that, <clears throat> either that, or the synchronous reluctance gets better. Mm -hmm. I think there's an ultimate limit there. See, everything for efficiency when you get up above 90% runs into two different areas. It's the losses in the rotor, and that's where the induction motor and the, you know, the uh, the switched and synchronous reluctance motors have the potential problem. Mm -hmm. Where on the permanent magnet motor, your magnets are either buried in the iron or directly on the surface, so there are no losses, you know, being, uh, you know, I squared R type losses mm -hmm. that you, you would normally get. So that's always the problem the induction motor has. You, you, know, you have to have that squirrel cage copper, uh, uh, you know, construction inside the induction motor rotor. Well, the other technologies are using different ways, but the permanent magnet ultimately should be the best if we can make it uh, as cost effective as the induction motor has been. Okay. All right, good enough. Um, so maybe on a, uh, on a similar note here, or certainly a uh, related theme and topic is the question about uh, energy savings. Uh, that's something that you'd mentioned very early on in the presentation. I think it was one of the first several slides there, but um, and you mentioned a bit about how the the U.S. is doing pretty good with three-phase uh, induction motors. Um, 
are you seeing anything there in terms of uh, you know maybe other um, you know other uh, uh, energy savings demands coming kind of coming down the pike for for the um, for the U.S. market maybe uh, at least uh, and maybe areas where uh, you know where there's more difference let's say between the the U.S. and Europe or or even Asia in terms of what they're looking at and, uh, for for energy savings and and uh, motors. Well, Miles, there is interesting because in America we're looking at permanent magnet motors to give us the highest efficiency, mm -hmm. whether it's uh, ferrite or whether it's uh, uh, you know rare earth. And there are I know of at least eight going on in California alone, but I can't mm -hmm. mention them <laughs> at this point. <laughs> You'd probably have to look at the internet to get them, but uh, they're looking at efficiencies at least one or two percent better. And it's relatively easy under 50 horsepower to compare against the induction motor. And quite frankly, the three-phase induction motor is a target. It's a target in Europe by ABB for synchronous reluctance, and it's a target here for permanent magnet motors with higher power efficiencies. We're okay. going to see a lot more within the next year or two. Okay, sounds good. So kind of keep your keep your eyes peeled, I guess, right? Let's tune in for the next couple of presentations. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that sounds good. Um, okay, so uh, it looks like we're we're getting close uh, to the end of the hour here. So uh, uh, we might have an, uh, another few minutes here. So if you did want to get any more questions in, if you could think of something, um, and if not, uh, if we're kind of uh, if, uh, if we're out of questions here at the at the moment, uh, then maybe we can uh, we can begin to uh, wrap things up here. So um, and maybe I'll take take this time now to once again thank you, Dan, for uh, for your time and for your expertise and for your knowledge. Um, it's always a, uh, always a pleasure to to work with you and to uh, uh, to hear. Uh, what you're seeing out there in the in the world of motors and, and motion control. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, thanks everybody uh, as well for uh, who joined us here today for the uh, for the webinar and for the uh, presentation. A few final points here to mention. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the webinar will be up at designworldonline.com. Uh, and also, everyone, uh, everybody who registered for the webinar will get a, a copy of the presentation through email. Um, also, uh, if you want to tweet about this webinar at all on Twitter, you can use the hashtag there, uh, hashtag DWWebinar. Um, if you want to connect with Design World in many different ways, we are on the Internet in many different ways. We're on Facebook. You can look us up on, uh, on Facebook. Uh, on Twitter, uh, most of our, all of our editors really are on Twitter, uh, Google Plus as well, LinkedIn, Pinterest, and YouTube as well. And uh, we can also carry on the uh, discussion at engineeringexchange.com as well. And also uh, within the, the slides here from the webinar, you also have my contact information uh, as well as Dan's contact uh, information as well. So, um, so once again, as a final parting note here, thanks again to Dan for your time, and thank you everyone who, uh, who signed on today and joined us. And I uh, hope you have uh, a good rest of the day and a good rest of the week. And uh, we will see you again or hear you again maybe for a different webinar down the road. Thanks again, everyone. Turn out something for me. I'll call Miles. <laughs>